And we're with uh, Robert Pample, Bob Pample, a longtime friend of mine, longtime citizen of Sterling, Colorado. And he's going to tell us about his experiences in World War II uh, on his aircraft carrier and what, is, uh, ex what he did. So it, now it's all up to you, kid, okay. to tell us uh, <laughs> well, what's going okay. So uh, tell us your name. My name is Robert Anthony Pimple. And I was born in uh, St. Peter's, at south of Fleming, Colorado, in 1926, August 16, 1926. And I joined the service my junior year at St. Anthony's. A lot of the fellows that were going to school just got the urge to go. And we felt like everybody else was kind of going, so we joined the group. And, and a lot of us at St. Anthony's, in fact, my graduating class only had one boy left. They graduated. The rest of them all joined the service. What and year was that, Bob? That was, uh, let's see, uh, I got my, it was uh, October, uh, let's see. Take a look at your notes. Yeah. October 15th. 1944 is when I joined. October 15th. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now look right up. <coughs> Just. Okay. October 15th, 1944, huh? Yeah. And how old were you? Uh, I had just, uh, I had to wait a, a period of time because they wouldn't take me because I was 16, so I just turned my 17th birthday in uh, the August previous to October. And, uh, when I got in the service, there were several other, uh, one particularly that turned out to be a good buddy of mine. He joined the same age, and we were kind of noted at the two youngest seamen on board the Cape Gloucester. Uh, after uh, boot camp at Farragut, Idaho, I went to uh, a kind of a pre-commissioning school. Our ship was still being built at the Todd Pacific uh, shipyards in Bremerton, Washington. And we went to uh, radar school at Bremerton, Washington. And then from there, we went to Tacoma, Washington. And then after we had a brief training period there, we went right on board ship the minute the ship was commissioned. And uh, we'll never forget the trip down Puget Sound, which was some of the roughest water in the Pacific. That's coming out of there. We first had to go to Port Washington, or Port Townsend in in uh, Washington there to pick up ammunition and stuff like that on our carrier before we shoved out for the Pacific. And everybody had their, their own bucket because there was a lot of seasick. Uh, we were all almost basic people except for the officers that were naturally, they were what we call old salts because they, they had been in the Navy quite a few years. And it wouldn't have been for those fellas helping us I don't know whether some of us would have even made the first couple of months on board that carrier. Anyway, we, uh, most of our action was uh, out in the South Pacific, and we would uh, have our home base in uh, San Diego. And uh, whenever we had to replace some fighter planes or any kind of uh, stuff on our ship, we would always head back to San Diego. And if we had to replace some uh, F-4Us, uh, of our fighter squadron, we would pick them up at um, Alameda, California. And uh, now, when you left, when you left Washington, you guys headed for the South Pacific, and uh, did you go right into uh, action? Then what happened? Well, uh, we everything in those days, believe it or not, even though you was on board ship, uh, they would kind of tell you in very short notice kind of where you was going. Right even though we, uh, we were chiefly noted to be a, kind of an escort carrier and kind of protection as far as hunting submarines down that would, uh, Japanese submarines were known to be out uh, roving around uh, just trying to pick up any American ship they could. And uh, we had uh, a, a, a group of TBMs, they were the torpedo uh, bombers, we had them on board our carrier and those fellows would go out with their torpedoes and, and try to 
see if they could notice anything that was going to be headed for where our battle was going to be. And usually it would be in the South Pacific, but we also could roam in the territory of the North Pacific. And uh, in fact, we had uh, uh, towards the end of after Okinawa, towards the end there, we had a sojourn in the East China Sea. And that's uh, uh, kind of the later stages before they kept us out there in the area where they wanted us to group because we knew that something was in the works. And that was in, uh, in June. And uh, we were headed for parts we really didn't know for sure, but we had an inkling it was going to be Tokyo. And uh, that's where, believe it or not, my birthday is August 16th. And on August 15th is when they bombed Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And uh, we was one of the ships that went in and docked uh, out about two miles in Sasebo, Japan. And from there, we had to go ashore and establish a fleet post office. It's the number one thing that they wanted to get after they occupied that territory. And uh, we wasn't notified too much about the nuclear fallout and everything. And, and, uh, and then we found out later on that we went in there too early. And there's actually been noted in several documents in our uh, CBE Piper paper that's published. And when you're a member, you get a copy. and. Uh, they was, in fact, they was uh, doing some scientific research on some of the diseases that the fellows are kind of coming down with now in their later years, kind of associated with a little bit of the nuclear fallout that was so heavy in Sasebo Harbor. So how far was Sasebo from, say, Nagasaki or Hiroshima, would you guess? Well, it wasn't too far because you could take a motor whaleboat to either place. Uh, from your ship, and uh, by not having any kind of piers, you was naturally docked out oh, anywhere from three to four miles, and depending upon the size ship you was and how many there was coming in after you. Uh, unfortunately, I guess because we was noted to kind of be out for the submarine patrol because one of the last stages that the Japanese were going to really use on the United States forces was actually their, what they called their small midget submarines. They were two-man operated, and their principle was going to be the same as the kamikaze plane was. They, they were to be used strictly to go out and sink uh, cargo ships and warships and then never return. And uh, believe it or not, when they dropped that bomb and when we pulled into Sasebo Harbor, we uh, went by one area of a building that was completely blowed in half by the bomb and then it, ex it ex ex exposed the small submarines that they had in those catacombs ready to use. And fortunately, they never did get a chance. Yeah. And the <clears throat> devastation in Nagasaki and Hiroshima both was something that you just couldn't hardly believe it uh, was something that we all wanted the war to end, but then you had a feeling inside of you that you wanted to be able to kind of get humanity to, to see that you'd never want something like that to happen again. Uh, we all had Pearl Harbor in our mind during all of our uh, different sorties that we would make and everything, and they were truly an enemy that we wanted to devastate, but it was awful hard to comprehend that the war had to end the way it did with the atomic bomb. And just about everybody on our ship, and I had the misfortune that August 15th, when they dropped the big one, that was the day before my birthday, which is August 16th. And uh, I naturally wrote home and it was kind of hard. And uh, during all of this time that uh, these later stages of the war for me was going on, 
on June 15, 1945, my father passed away. And being out there, there was no way the Red Cross could get a hold of me. And we had the misfortune of having a typhoon hit something terrible after the Okinawa siege. And the typhoon was so bad that we did not get no mail for a long time. And when you get mail, it's in a stack usually, and you don't sort them out. You're so anxious to start reading them. You don't sort the letters out. You just start reading the top one. And I opened the top letter, and it was from my sister Mildred. She had served in the waves, and she was the first one that notified me that she started it like this in the letter. She said, Mother's doing fine, considering it's only been five weeks since Dad passed away. And that was probably one of the most tragic things that happened to me during the whole war. Uh, I had a Marine behind me in the chow line when I was reading the letter, and he immediately took me to the chaplain. And uh, the con consolation that the chaplain gave me, he was a all-denomination chaplain, which they had to have in those days. They didn't have enough for each religion, so he was very, very consoling and helped me a lot, plus this Marine that I knew personally. He helped me a lot, and it was something that, to this day, it kind of breaks me up when I think about it. Because my father and I, up to my 16th birthday when I left to join the Navy, we were as close as you could possibly be as a father and son. I, to this day, it really brings back some of the memories I'd like to forget, but you don't forget those kind of memories. But to get back to the service on the Cape, after the, the securing of uh, the post office in uh, Sasebo there, and going ashore and see the devastation, uh, then our next assignment was to go pick up a bunch of uh, the first prisoners of the Japanese. They were the Australian uh, from the Battle of Borneo and, and places like that. And we picked them up, and they brought them on our carrier, and then we'd take them back. They'd take them back to their home base, and and then uh, we'd feed them and clothe them, and that was something that wasn't nice to see either. Most of them, I'd say their body weight was probably in the neighborhood of maybe 70 to 80 pounds at the most, some of them even less than that. And uh, we gave them more food than they could really handle because they were so starved. And that was one of the bad experiences on board our carrier because we was on a continual cleanup operation, everybody, no matter what division you was in. How, m how many of those guys did you pick up? Well, we went back for two trips. And uh, I would say the complement of the prisoners we had were in the hundreds. I probably couldn't really pinpoint the numbers for sure. But I know we had cots on the hangar deck and just about every place there was any vacant space, we accommodated these people. And uh, they had some stories that would make yours kind of seem trifle compared to theirs. And uh, it was an, an experience too that you really don't want to remember, but that kind of stuff stays in your mind and you remember it way in your years, like even my years now, I'll be 78, August 16th, and these things I don't think will ever leave me. Uh, now as far as the liberty goes, uh, whenever we would get liberty, it'd usually be in San Diego, and I'll never forget, I, I learned to love San Diego, California, and uh, to this day, uh, my wife and I, when we got married in 53, we never had a honeymoon, so I told her, I said, well, we're going to go to Long Beach, California. And uh, we went there, and it brought back some good memories to go along with my bad memories, because we had some pretty nice liberties in Long Beach on the pike. And uh, of course, in 1955, that had changed so much from the, from the war years that uh, we didn't hardly recognize it. And uh, now I'm back 
as a city. I uh, am close to the family. I have a son and a daughter-in-law and two grandsons, or I know a grandson and a granddaughter. And I'm so proud of my family that I have that it's helping me live my later years and to finally have a little peace of mind. Uh, I don't know uh, whether there's anything else that uh, comes to mind that you'd be interesting in. What, when you, were in the, when you were out on the carrier, what were some of the big actions you were in? You well, uh, we had a, a F4U fighter squadron, VMF uh, 351, and it was a very good fighter squadron. And several of the pilots we had on there, it was a, it was a Marine group, and they were all, in fact, in my B1 division, besides my buddy Dwayne Jarvis and myself, they were only about, I'd say maybe another half a dozen or so sailors. Most of them were all Marines. And uh, this saying that there was a lot of dissension among sailors and Marines, we never had no problem at all. In fact, I kind of learned to be a little bit more military-like from the Marine detachment that we had on our carrier. Uh, we had one uh, Lieutenant uh, Hughes, and uh, he had an F4U, and he uh, had, uh, I think, five Japanese kills to his credit. And uh, most of his, uh, see, we would launch our fighter squadrons and everything, and they'd go where the action would be. We didn't have too much action come our way, thank heavens, because a lot of the carriers said, we wish we could kind of stay close to you guys, because you guys don't get in on the real thick of it. But and nevertheless, they'd go out on those sorties, and, and uh, uh, Lieutenant Hughes, I think he had his kills to come around, if I remember right, I think it was the island, and around the Kyushus, I think that's the way you pronounce it. It was a small Japanese island that was a little further down Okinawa. Uh, now to get back to, I'm backtracking a little bit here, but after the war did end and they dropped the bomb, we were anchored in Buckner Bay in Okinawa. And uh, believe it or not, there were some of the Japanese pilots that didn't know the war was over with. And there was one, I think we nicknamed the plane that was coming over and we had the general quarter sound. And we had what they called small, uh, we call them fog boats. They would go around our carrier and lay out a, a screen of fog around our carrier so that if any plane coming in like that, uh, if I remember right, I think it was nicknamed Betty, was the Japanese plane that was coming in. And he didn't know the war was over with because we could tell he was getting ready to, to you could tell by the sound of his motor that he was coming in and we got our fog around our carrier, but the Pennsylvania that was anchored down from where we was anchored in Buckner Bay, it got nailed. And there was, I think, if I remember right, there was 16 or 17 casualties, I think, on the Pennsylvania at that time. And uh, on board the Pennsylvania was one of my school buddies from St. Anthony's, George Schutte. He came from a big family in Sterling here, and several of his brothers were in the Navy also. And uh, I finally got to see George again later on in San Diego. And we had, had a little conversation about what had happened there in Buckner Bay. It was awful scary because we thought the war was over with and everybody was relaxing a little bit and then here comes this Japanese that didn't know the war was over with. And he could have just as well laid one in on us as the Pennsylvania, but there again, my ship was very fortunate. And as I look back at my service on board the Cape Gloucester, I thank my lucky stars and along with my buddies we were very, very fortunate compared to a lot of other servicemen. How many, how many were on the crew of the Gloucester, Cape Gloucester? We had a complement of between 1,900 and 2,000, I think. 2,000. I really don't quite know for sure. Yeah. Uh, I know my uh, book that they gave us there, the, the U.S. Cape, it's a blue album book. It states in there just exactly, but my memory ain't quite good enough to remember that well, right that, now. Just, that's a lot of folks. 
Well, it's a lot of folks. around on one ship, isn't and, it? And we were one of the bigger uh, CVEs because we was made by the Todd Pacific Shipyards, and we were kind of the... Uh, How the, many planes did you have when you, when you were launching planes? How many did you launch? Well, it would depend how many <coughs> we would require and how many we really had ready. We would always launch the uh, uh, F-4Us, and uh, they, they were the gall wing uh, fighter plane, very, very good plane. In fact, the Japanese didn't hardly anything, have anything that could compare with the way it could uh, maneuver in the skies. That's the reason they could get in on the zeros, because they could maneuver so much better. And then uh, we had a, a squadron of TBMs. We called them turkeys because when they come in for a landing on our carrier, they would come in at a much lesser speed than the F-4Us. In fact, some of those guys got so good they could just pick the deck pennant that they'd want to get their uh, tail hook to hit. That's how good they would get. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Now the F-4Us, some of them, and especially if they'd get shot up a little bit, because see, these planes would go out on sorties and then they would get shot up, we wouldn't, they, they wouldn't be right around us, but they would come in and radio CIC, which was Central Intelligence Center, and uh, they would tell them just the trouble that they had and kind of get ready for maybe a hot landing or something like that, and then that would give the people on board a little bit of forewarning what was going to happen. We had a few that would uh, miss the deck pen and go into what we had. Uh, cable barriers. They were something that would come up hydraulically from the flight deck, and in case they didn't pick up their deck pennant, they would immediately go into these uh, cable barriers, and that would stop them, but it would do a lot, a lot of damage to the aircraft. Yeah. And then there would be a terrific uh, scurrying about on the flight deck. That's what the, the Airedales, which was V-1 Division, we had to get out there and, and uh, get those deck pennants ready to go for the next plane that would be ready to launch, or I mean to land, and you didn't have much time, and uh, that's when the elevators came in handy, uh, because you'd move, even if it was damaged, you'd move it on the forward elevator and take it down to the, to the hangar deck, which was below the flight deck, and if they were really bad, you'd take them over on the jettison ramp later on, and jettison them rather than to try to fix them up. Just dump them over. Just dump them overboard, yeah. Yeah. And uh, we had several happenings like that. And uh, the landing control officer that had the job of giving them the wave off if they wasn't coming in just right, because CVEs weren't known to have all that much landing space, and and uh, you got hand hand to the pilots of the uh, planes on the CVEs because. In fact, we had one guy, he'd you know, always say, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, where did the carrier go? <laughs> because he was, he was getting low on fuel, and, and he knew he only had him a couple more times around, and then he was going to probably have to ditch. In fact, we did have one fellow that was getting kind of low. I think, uh, his, I think it was Lieutenant Fitzpatrick was his name, if I remember right. And I remember it coming down on the CIC uh, uh, information deal that, he was going to take it up and bail out rather than take a chance of coming in. And naturally, he got the okay to go ahead and do that. And I failed to mention that we always had a destroyer following close behind us because there was no such thing as a helicopter in those days. And we had a destroyer that would follow behind us. And if the guy was fortunate enough to get out on his wing and get his raft blowed up and everything, why, or his, uh, uh, his, uh, life jacket and everything ready while he was able to be picked up by our destroyer. And we had quite a few of those that we'd, uh, uh, we had the opportunity to bring them back on board and there was usually a little bit of a celebration because uh, we were always glad to see them come back on board no matter how they'd done it. And uh, the action wasn't really what you'd call ferocious for me because being in the V1 division, I was mostly in maintenance uh, my buddy Jarvis and I, we had to maintain some of the cable that would operate the, the hydraulic system for the catapult. And then every once in a while we'd get on the, 
the deck pen and deck pen and duty where you'd have to run out there with big leather gloves on and and release the cable from the tail hook so that the plane could taxi forward. Uh, not exactly one of the safest jobs, but you knew how to make sure you was thinking pretty straight when you had that kind of duty. So what was your rank and rate? What was your rank and rate? Well, I had the misfortune on board the carrier. I went in as a seaman second class, and believe it or not, that's when I, that was my rank when I left the came out carrier way, seaman yeah. second class. They would always make me a, I wanted to get a, a striker boatswain mate first class is what I was striking for all the time. But every time I'd get ready to try to pass the old test and get that rank, why the quota would be filled up. So, so every once in a while, they'd kind of make me an acting uh, seaman first when we was out to sea, and then that way my pay would double from, I think it was 28.60 to 46 dollars and something. 46 bucks a, a month. month. Yeah, right. Wow. So, <laughs> but back in those days, you uh, believe it or not, uh, I think from those days it taught me how to budget myself throughout my whole life because by losing my father like that, uh, whenever I'd get a payday, most of it went home in the form of a $10 war bond, and I figured uh, that would be my way that I could kind of help out at home, and uh, because I knew they was having a tough time, and I also knew that uh, uh, me being able to buy candy bars for five cents a piece and, and all the gidunks, that was the name for ice cream cones on our carrier, called gidunk, and that, that was one line that if you didn't get in fairly early, why well, you had to stand in there a long time because everybody liked their ice cream. Uh, so it was, I, I kind of call it a floating sea wall, we, a, a floating, floating sea city because actually we had our own drugstore, we had our own laundry, and uh, it was really a, a nice cruise for me. I, I can never go back and say that, uh, in fact, I often wonder if maybe my father hadn't passed away, but what maybe I might have signed on. and. Means I went in so early. If I would have went in, just think, I could have retired when I was 36 with 20 years in, and that would have made a nice little check for my civilian years. Sure enough. But I knew what the situation was at home, so I went home whenever I had the opportunity of getting discharged, and uh, went to work immediately. Usually holding down a couple of jobs to try to make it in those days. But that was about the entire service hitch for this guy and like I say there's some of it that I look back on and wished I could kind of forget but there's other times that I look back uh, I'm kind of uh, sentimental and I get kind of uh, I got one fellow believe it or not uh, his name is Ralph Braden and he lives in uh, he lives in uh, Marino California and uh, he still calls me and uh, even though I shake quite a bit, I, I still am able to scribble a letter to him and we communicate back and forth. And it's sure nice to have one buddy that's, that's able to communicate from the Cape. And uh, I'd often wanted to go back to some of the conventions, but with my, uh, I kind of got a little bit of a shaking factor here and plus uh, uh, a little bit of neuropathy in my legs. so. I'm not all that steady anymore when it comes to walking, so I just assume play it safe and read my piper and be happy that I can do that. That's okay. Did you get any uh, medals? You must have had some group medals and stuff. Oh like yeah, that. we. Uh, I had a. Uh, it was just a single, uh, short uh, uh, row of ribbons. It was uh, the uh, the ribbons were in honor of the Asiatic Pacific uh, War Theater. And then, uh, depending upon how many times you went out in that area, you got a gold star on that particular ribbon. And then we all got the good honor uh, ribbon if we didn't get in no trouble. And that's one thing I never got into no trouble. I was pretty fortunate that way. <laughs> I don't know whether I was conniving or whether I was just a good boy, but I kind of had my upbringing and, and uh, I never really got into any trouble. So where, did, where, where was your place near St. Peter's? The, the farm? Yeah. The farm was located about four and a half miles 
right out of St. Peter's. In fact, uh, I used to walk to the St. Peter's school. Uh, I was in the second grade before I went to Fleming. But I used to walk to that school in St. Peter's there. And the house that we lived in was only about, oh, I'd say it was in the neighborhood of between three and four miles. You'd Which way? To, you'd have to get up real early. North or south or east or west? Well, it would, we lived south of Fleming, so it would be going uh, north. North. north of St. Yeah, Peter's. Yeah, it'd be north of, north of St. Peter's. It was okay. where the school was at. Yeah. And uh, there's still quite a few of my cousins living that went to the same school. In fact, my one sister that recently passed away out in Arizona, Lucille and uh, Dorothy, I think they went to St. Peter's. And uh, Melder, she's two years older than I am. She's the only surviving sister I have left. And uh, I think she also went to St. Peter's before we went to Fleming. And then from Fleming, we went to St. Anthony's. We moved to Fleming in 1934 because Dad had to sell everything on the farm. That was what you call the tail end of the Depression. And if you was in debt to the bank, you didn't have no choice. You had to get whatever money you could out. We had about a dozen working horses. We never had no uh, tractors or anything like that. It was all strictly pulled by working horses. And uh, most of that stuff went for just barely to kind of satisfy the banker. In fact, I remember my dad saying, I got a, a wagon load of seed in the granary over there. And Ed Euler was one of our neighbors. He lived down the road quite a ways from us, but he was one of our neighbors and he was always a good friend. And Ed wasn't in debt too much to the bank. So dad said, why don't you take this seed? He said, I ain't gonna get nothing from the bank or from anybody anyway to satisfy the bank. So Ed, he took the seed and he stuck it out. And Ed kind of done pretty good for himself. Yeah. But Dad, we uh, we done all right. He was on the WPA when we came to Sterling in '34, and then from there he got a break. And a fellow that was operating the Capitol Hill Cream Station, and being his dad knew so many farmers, why well, he hired him right away to run the Capitol Hill Cream Station, and that's what he when he done what he done up till the time I went in the service, and I wished I could have went back and had him there to go back to to work and to help him in the cream station. But uh, it was not to happen. So you had, now tell me about your family and your kids. You got, you mentioned your family. Yeah, I got Bobby, uh, I got married in 53 to Lillian Habicorn and uh, we, our firstborn uh, uh, died at birth and uh, the first thing the doctor said was, well, you're going to have to get with it because you're definitely going to need a child to replace that. And so uh, about a year and a half, two years later, we had Bobby, my son. And uh, he's going to be 45. Well, he was born on my birthday, August 16th. Oh, oh, so good. He'll, he'll be 46, rather, this coming year. And I'll be 78. And I had the misfortune in my civilian life of having another tragedy. My wife contacted cancer and she died in 1974, and uh, I've been alone since then. So what about Bobby now? Is Bobby married and got grandkids? Or oh yeah, I got uh, a granddaughter and a grandson. Uh, my grandson's going to uh, Greeley next year, UNC. He graduated yeah. from NJC. And I'm so proud of him because they all got a 4-0 through their whole high school and junior college education. Wow. And my granddaughter, she goes into junior college uh, this coming year. And her high school, she uh, was a, a 3.38 uh, uh, grade her. average. So she uh, she lacked going out and getting some advertising, I guess, for the <laughs> for the school paper, and they took a few points away from it. Otherwise, she would have graduated with a straight 4.0. Oh. But she has her sales set to get a 4.0 in junior college, which she probably will. So I'm very proud of my family, and I. Miss my wife something tremendously. We had 21 years together, but uh, she was eight years younger than I was, and it's kind of been a pretty tough road. What, Bob, what did you do after you got out of the war? Now, you came back, you said you were working two jobs. Yeah. And to kind of yeah. keep things together. Well, what well, the kind of work did you do? The first thing I'd done, I went and worked for a freight company. Uh, my brother, George, uh, 
he was older than I was, and he was always uh, driving a freight truck. And and uh, between him letting me work part time on the freight dock, unloading the transports and putting them on the delivery trucks, I had that job. And then I had a job with uh, Goodrich Dairy. Uh, they had a, a milk route. They had to get up four in the morning, and we'd go and pick up. They had uh, milk was a product that farmers really counted on back in those days, almost like cream back in the days of my father's cream station. But I would help them load those milk trucks and then we'd bring them back to the dairy. And that was one of my better jobs, better paying jobs, I should say, because it paid in the neighborhood of about $50, $60 a week, which was pretty good money back in those days. And then the freight company job was only a minimal of hours until I got the freight off the big trucks and on the delivery trucks and then my my clock was being punched, which was only, only usually about three, three and a half hours of labor time. But I made it pretty good, and then later on I undertook the job of laying carpet. And I'll have to say that I really enjoyed my years of laying carpet. I had 30, almost 30 years of being a carpet layer. Of course, back in those days when I was laying carpet in the, in the 70s and the 80s, a dollar and a quarter a yard was a pretty good price. Now, now I wished I was getting what carpet layers are getting, but that's neither here nor there either. So, <laughs> so you laid a lot of carpet, I guess. I sure okay. have. I've yeah. been on my knees. So did uh, did you who, did you work for somebody laying carpet, or did you sell it and lay it yourself, or what happened? Well, back when I started laying carpet, I was working for Snow Furniture, and a good friend of mine, Vern Inskeep, that happened to be in the cream station business when my father was. He came over to our apartment and knocked on the door and he said, Bobby, he said, we need somebody over at the furniture store to lay carpet. We're starting to sell quite a bit. And he said, if I would finance the tools, would you undertake it? And I said, you bet your boots I would. So he got me started laying carpet. And in those days, like I say, at a dollar and a quarter square yard, and I was one of the few carpet layers that hand sewed the seams. And, and nowadays they got an iron that does it. They iron their seams together. But nevertheless, I got pretty good at hand sewing my seams, so I was pretty much in demand as a carpet layer. And I laid carpet for four different places to start out with. It was Snow Furniture, which Vern Inskeep owned, and then I laid carpet for Gambles, and I laid carpet for Montgomery Wards, and I laid carpet for, uh, it was another furniture store on uh, Third Street, Mr. Pierce. I laid carpet for him, and then Sears got a nice store and they started handling carpets and I laid carpet for them. I had about five places going there towards the end and I, I was really getting a lot of work and I was sure happy because it helped me forget some of the tougher times when I didn't have that kind of money coming in. Well, good for you. Yeah. That's good. So. Well, we got a lot of good stuff for you and I think we got a good... Uh, good. The picture at the top of the desk. Is your group from Farragut, Idaho? Okay. There's Camp Binion. Do you want me to mention something about the Far Farragut, Idaho? Um, sure. Well, we had the misfortune of being opposite Camp Ward, and believe it or not, back in the early 40s there, they still had diphtheria, and Camp Ward had an outbreak of diphtheria, and uh, that quarantined quite a few of the the uh, surrounding buildings, and we was only across the, I think it was a, either a row of stairs going up to Camp Ward or a little tow bridge that we went across, and we was restricted from there because we didn't want to get a spread of any kind of diphtheria in our particular uh, boot camp uh, company there. And then these photos down below are pictures of the camp. Yeah, it shows the uh, it shows the commissary which we got to go uh, to on Friday night, pick up candy bars or shaving lotion or different things that we needed. And, uh, and then that other one there of us lined up on the grinder. The grinder was what they called the drill field, and uh, we had a lot of time spent on that thing, and you had to, uh, each company was competitive. I remember our flag bearer on our 
company. He was one of the sharpest in the bunch. And uh, he was always very proud of 873, and he made sure that we was always in step. And so, so he had us pretty much fine-tuned. And then there's one there, I think, of the uh, swimming pool. There's quite a story there. Uh, I never did learn how to swim. In fact, I often wondered how come I ended up in the Navy, means I couldn't swim. But after you see the size of those waves out there, I really don't know whether it would have helped that much or not. But anyway, in order to pass the test, you had to swim 90 yards. So I didn't drink any water for about three days <laughs> when it came time for me to take that test. And I'd go down and dog paddle for a ways, and then I'd come up and I'd dog paddle for a ways, and I finally made the 90 yards. And I passed the test in order to be able to go on with further training. I made a notation that inspection was usually at uh, 5.15 every morning and you were required to get up uh, at 5 o'clock in order to have everything squared away. So you had to really turn yourself on pretty good uh, to get that all done in 15 minutes so that your company would get good marks. And our company commander there at Farragut, Idaho was a regular Navy fella. He wasn't a uh, he wasn't. He was still, I think, a boatswain mate himself, and uh, he was very, very particular how he wanted things, and he made sure that you was going, was going to end up the same way he was. Of the smoking, it's called a smoking pit. Uh, there's that's where you'd have to go to smoke is in that area there, and then after the smoking lamp was out. For the last time during the day, during the end of the day, a group was randomly, randomly selected to go out and, and patrol the smoking pit for the cigarette butts. That wasn't exactly a, a very good detail, but everybody took it to heart that they wanted it to look good so that they'd get a good mark on having a clean smoking pit. And that uh, shows the great big uh, Quonset that was the drilling hall where we'd go for inside drill and we'd march over there to different patriotic uh, tunes and then when we'd get in there we'd have to do uh, certain uh, skills as far as our company goes. We'd have to uh, use our, uh, our wooden uh, rifle and know how to present arms and everything like that. We had to really work hard to be graded. We was always graded either in the top three or, or never any lower than that. And uh, we were very proud of our company when it came to that. High school, there was a nun that was, uh, she was very uh, stringent on uh, the young men that were going, going into service and she made a missile cover for me and put it on my religious missile, and I took that with me, and it went everywhere that I went uh, during the whole uh, hitch in the service. In fact, I even carried it for a while after I got out, and that thing was a lot of consolation to me when I got the sad news that my father had passed away, and to this day, it's uh, something that I treasure. One car there that's uh, uh, coated in plastic because you never want to lose that. That's your regular discharge the time that you served in the in the Navy and it has your fingerprint on there and your blood type and uh, I have my dog tags at home. I didn't bring them with me but it gives it your blood type in case you give blood to anybody and then the card below that is the uh, reserve card. That's the thing you automatically went into when you got out of World War II. You went into what was called V6 which was a reserve and believe it or not, when the Korean War started, they would go alphabetically and how much time you'd been home as to whether you was going to get called back for the Korean service. And there was a good friend of mine that was, his last name started with M. And fortunately, they got enough uh, reserves to fill the quota that they needed out of Sterling before they got the, the M's and my last name being pimple was the P, so we were pretty fortunate not having to go back in the Korean War. The card here is something that we had handed to us when we uh, went into Sasebo. It was kind of 
Uh, nowadays, if there'd be such a thing as a chamber of commerce back in those days, I'd probably say that's uh, a representation of a big nightclub in Kobe, Japan, where they welcome servicemen, and I never had the opportunity to use it. And, uh, there was no limit times that you could use it, but we never we never got to dock in there to go to Kobe, Japan, to enjoy that nightclub that they gave that flyer to us. Mm -hmm. and, and this picture represents a picture right shortly uh, before we went on that last uh, mission that we really didn't know for sure where we was going, but we knew that being there was such a big armada of Navy ships in Lady Gulf that we knew probably the next place was going to be Tokyo. So Jarvis and I, one Sunday afternoon, we had a buddy to take a picture of him and I together, being as we were very close as buddies on the carrier. And he was from Salt Lake City. He was a Mormon and I was a Catholic and he would go to my mass and I would go to his services because we had a all, all denomination a chaplain on board there with, a, with a, what they call foul weather gear jacket on. And Jarvis is to the right. He always said, I don't know where mine's at. So he, it was kind of a chilly day that day too. And he just had his dungaree, what they call the old salt shirt on. Okay. Yeah, this is a personnel picture that they took in Los Angeles. We were docked there and uh, we was taking on supplies so they decided it would be a very good time to take a picture of the crew, the full officers and enlisted personnel of the Cape Gloucester, which is in the background. It's a very, very nice picture of our ship, and I'm very proud that I kept that. Uh, I'm sure a lot of the fellows on board ship did, but maybe some of them lost theirs, and, and I would love to be able to share a copy of this with them if they would want one, but I don't know how I would really do that. But I know I've always treasured this picture of the Cape with all the personnel and the officers in the front of it there. Density. It showed the intensity of the heat from that atomic bomb. It showed the outline of people that were standing on that bridge. And it showed the shadow that scorched in between their figures. So that gave you a, a rough idea of how hot uh, that must have been for that concrete and all that to, to show something that devastating. And this is in the paper that you get every yeah, two months? Yeah, I think it's bi-monthly, I can't really, I'm so welcome to get it, I really don't pay too much attention, but I think it is, I think we get six deals a year. And I'm a life member now, so it's always 25 bucks a month if you're not a life member, so I just paid out 125 here about three years ago, so I'm a life member now, paid up. And it's always a welcome paper to get because it has some of the pictures of some of the people that you kind of wish you could go back to those conventions and really meet them again. I just wish my health would let me do it, but it sure don't. <laughs>